Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, filmmaking freedom for the independent. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can see that, well, there's a video this time. <laughs> and for those of you who are listening via audio on iTunes or Stitcher Radio or Google Play or wherever you listen to podcasts, welcome. This is actually part two of what if your script sucks and how to fix it. And if you haven't listened to part one, I recommend going back to that because otherwise this part two will make no sense to you whatsoever. So in part one, I essentially said that the writing process is so important, obviously, because now that any of us in the independent film space can make a film, like, like myself, the $500 feature film with no crew, um, I, this next film I'm working on, I want to be able to tell a much better story. But I also wanted to be transparent and share all the bumps and bruises of the creative writing process. Because um, I don't think it served anybody any good if all of a sudden I said, hey, well, I'm about to shoot my next film. We just finished the script and we're going to production. The script part, I think, is so important because I just want to make sure that whatever I'm delivering is the best I can deliver it. And I look towards like a company like Pixar who has consistently made so many amazing movies um, through a process they they refined called the Brain Trust. And, you know, it's interesting to see that they've taken this Brain Trust concept and the way they, they work, you know, story, and they translate it to Disney when they took over Disney a couple of years. And so, although my film is not an animated, you know, family film, it's a, the, of the horror paranormal genre, I still wanted to see what principles we can learn from that, learn from Pixar, and share that with you guys so that if you are working on a story or a script, maybe you can uh, approach some of these techniques to help tell your story better. And so part one was I literally present an audio presentation of the current script I'm working on. It has a lot of flaws, but this allowed me to share it with my guests who are going to be part of this brain trust session on this part, part two, and you'll see everybody sort of discussing it from that, that perspective. Again, if you're not familiar with what the Pixar Brain Trust is, then we'll sit back and let's listen to Ed Catmull, president and you know one of the original founders of Pixar, explain what the Pixar Brain Trust is and how it works. And then right after that, we're going to go right into the session of how I created my own makeshift Brain Trust group to workshop the current script that I'm working on. So sit back and enjoy. I hope you get a lot of value out of this. I hope you can see the creative uh, process in works and how you can apply that to your own uh, project. So with that said, here's Ed Catmull himself explaining what the Pixar Brain Trust is. The, the Brain Trust is something we, we happened on accidentally. Uh, John was the director and he had four people around him who were uh, very focused and funny and really driven and they, and they were passionate about the film itself. So they would have intense discussions, but it was never personal. And they basically went through three films together. And this was so successful that w as other people were coming up, we would add them to this thing. Uh, and then uh, Andrew Stanton started to call it the Brain Trust. So there was something about having colleagues giving notes to each other that worked really well. So we tried to apply the principle to other groups, like with our technical groups and, and others, and we found that it didn't work as well. So then we had to go back and look at it and, and say, okay, what's actually going on here that's making this group work better than just a collection of smart people? Which is, for, for a lot of people, a brain trust means, oh, you get your smart people together in your room, you discuss it. So that's not what I mean. Um, so one of the things we realized is that the brain trust had no authority. They could not tell the director what to do. So when somebody else was directing, and now John is a member of it, uh, he could not tell them what to do. I couldn't tell them what to do. Steve couldn't tell them what to do. Uh, and the consequence of that is that the director, the person responsible, was not coming into the, to the room in a defensive posture, knowing that this group could screw him over. All right, so it changed the dynamics. But then we had to pay attention to a lot of elements of the dynamics because in our case, we need a lot of deep candor about what works and what doesn't work. And what we found, and this is true in most places, is there are good reasons why most people hold back and they don't say what they think. Yeah. They don't want to embarrass themselves. 
They don't want to embarrass other people. They want to look good in front of other people. Uh, they might want to grandstand. Uh, just, there are all sorts of personal, emotional reasons that get in the way frequently, and, and most of the time actually, they won't admit that they're there. So our view was that as, as the managers, was not to actually examine the idea at, at the time. It was to sit back and examine the dynamics of the room. Because if the dynamics are working, they're going to solve the problem. So rather than me get caught up in the problem, I want to look and say, OK, are they all saying what they think? And the, the result is we've got this group which, on the whole, has done uh, com completely remarkable things. Every once in a while, it doesn't work. It collapses. And every once in a while, magic happens. But by setting that up and paying attention to it, we've got something where, on the whole, it does. It, it's a remarkable body of work. OK, now we're recording. And I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity. Those who are listening to it on the audio version of the podcast uh, have an opportunity uh, to know whose voice is whose. So let's start with uh, <laughs> Alex Ferrari. And those of you who are watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see us laughing video-wise. So yes. Alex, you were laughing, but I know why. Yes. But go ahead and introduce yourself so people know who, what your voice sounds like, who you are, and any other any plugs you want to give, and we'll sit back for the next half hour to listen to all the plugs you have. No, that's okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Ferrari. I'm the uh, founder of IndieFilmHustle.com and the uh, podcast, the Indie Film Hustle podcast. And I am here to support my good friend Scott on his journey of writing this screenplay. And and to be honest with you, I think it's one of the bravest things I've ever seen anybody do. To put out a in work in progress screenplay for the world to read and criticize out there, not us, but everybody else, and and then have a bunch of people come together and and, and beat him up mercilessly, <laughs> mer horribly. So, um, but uh, but I'm here to support my main man Scott, and uh, I can't wait to get into it. Cool. That's Alex. Um, hey, Chris. Uh, we see that you're here, but are you able to join in, or you just want to listen in? We see that you're muted right now, Christopher Holland, of FilmFestivalSecrets.com. Okay, so we'll move on. So he's here. He might be listening, but we're going to move to Dave Bullis. <laughs> Dave, why don't you introduce yourself so people know what your voice sounds like and uh, whatever plugs you want to give. Uh, well, thank you, Scott. Uh, my name is Dave Bullis. Uh, I am the host of the Dave Bullis Podcast. You can find me at DaveBullis.com. Uh, I want to echo what Alex was saying, by the way. You know, I think this is a very important uh, development tool uh, because, you know, I like I, I oftentimes I see, you know, uh, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, and other projects, and nobody really talks about the script. And <laughs> it's kind of concerning to me because it's almost like an afterthought and they're like, oh yeah, we're raising you know twenty thousand for this movie, and the script's not done. Well, if the script's not done, how do you know what your budget's going to be? Uh, so I think this is a very important tool, and I really hope more filmmakers not necessarily have to emulate this whole process exactly, but I hope they emulate some that they. I hope they do something similar, even within a private brain trust. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And hey, we have Jason Buff. So um, Jason. Why don't you give us a uh, hello? We don't see your face, no. um, but your audio is kind of shitty. So, <laughs> so uh, give us a, uh, give us an intro so people know who you are and what your voice sounds like. Well, I mean, if you can hear me, I can just say uh, this is Jason Buff from the Indie Film Academy at IndieFilmAcademy.com. Um, yeah, I just have the same thing to say that everybody else does. I think this is a really cool idea that most people don't know how screenplays like the ones that come out of Pixar really, you know, are so consistently good. And through talking with a guy like Rob Edwards and, and doing something like this, it's really interesting to kind of take their formula and try and work with it. So I think this is a great idea. Cool. Thank you guys so much. for. So everybody knows each other's voices, so those who are listening to audio-wise will get an opportunity to like, oh, that's who's talking. Okay, so we'll jump right into it. Uh, this is not a Pixar film, obviously, but I was always fascinated by how Pixar was consistently able to make, you know, one emotionally touching story after another, and then they were able to translate that when they took over the, the Disney creative process, and it took them some time, but they got there, obviously, with these, you know, huge hits like Frozen and so on, and... Um, 
And both, you know, because uh, Jason Buff had um, screenwriter uh, Rob Edwards on his podcast, um, I was able to reach out to Rob as well and get him on my podcast because I, I wanted to, to not talk about the same things that Jason did because it was an amazing two-hour interview. And then mine was really focused on the brain trust aspect of Pixar. And for, again, so those who don't really know that what the brain trust is in Pixar, they have developed this sort of system um, where it's to make the story as best they can. And they, like, whoever's responsible for the story, normally what would happen was, like, in our, we would be in a room with maybe a lot more people, but, you know, we have the three of us or four of us, and in the room I would have the storyboards. So, like, one side of the wall would be the first act, once the another wall would be uh, act two broken up A and B, and then the one other wall would be act three. And so, and then the, the creative team would have to perform, you know, the story to all the other members of the Brain Trust group. And what works for the Brain Trust group is ca being candid. You could say brutally honest, but the whole point is everybody's there to, you know, not nothing's personal. It's all about how do we make this story better? Like, so everybody's passionate about trying to tell the better story. So whatever notes or the conversation that comes up during these Brain Trust meetings, the creative lead, whoever the director is of that particular story project, they actually don't have to take any of the notes. So, like, I might be in that room in Pixar as a screenwriter, and John Lasseter and Andrew Stan and Pete Doctor are telling me all these different things, and Brad Bird's telling me all these different things. They're not like studio suits where you have to take the notes and you have to implement them. You can disregard all of it if you want to. The whole point is that the process is there to help push forward the best story they, they can, you know, write and develop at, at that place. And they try to essentially say there's no hierarchy when they do the brain trust. Everyone's to essentially equal because they're all there to serve the story. So with that said, I didn't have storyboards yet, right? So I handed you guys, like, you could read the script or I actually went out and did an audio performance with sound effects and music. In the, By the way, I was going to say, <laughs> awesome production on the <laughs> screenplay audio version. I've Wonderful. Very nice. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. So <laughs> with that said, that was my version of my acting out presentation to make it easier for you guys. So from the Rob Edwards interview on our, our podcast or from Jason and mine, um, when I asked him about what happened when he was in the room with John Lasseter, like how was the brain trust meeting conducted? And he said the first thing that uh, Lasseter did was says, let's, he goes right to the third act. And he asks his, you know, story team, like, what is it in the third act that, what is the moment that we're, that is supposed to transform the protagonist and the audience? What is this, what is the one moment that we're shooting for? And it's interesting enough, because Andrew Stanton, Stanton, on his famous TEDx talk, um, talks about that. They all, they sort of reverse engineer, like, like all stories are sort of like a joke. There's a setup, you know, and then the punchline. So if we start with sort of the punchline or the third act, uh, my question is, um, what do you think the moment was in the third act? Um, I know what I was trying to shoot for, um, but the, the big question is, did I accomplish that moment? <laughs> I, I think I know what the, the answer is, but <laughs> if th those who forget, the, the reality is, is um, again, if you're jumping into this, you have to go back to the, the previous podcast episode where you can listen to the entire script being performed. Uh, in the whole movie, so you understand what we're talking about here. So the third act, the main character, Sarah Jacobs, is a 12-year-old uh, girl who's alone at, the, at her home um, when she's attacked by uh, a vengeful spirit. And so this is a moment um, where, you know, the entire movie, I was hoping that it just shows that like, it's just survival mode, survival mode. And she has to do something to not only save herself, but she has to save the soul of her grandmother and, you know, just just to survive. Cause, um, and I wanted that moment to be sort of that, like, victorious moment where you finally feel with her that you're, she's standing up. Um, with that said, I'm going to go down the line, you know, in terms of, of you guys. Was the story clear enough that this moment um, happened? And why wasn't, if it was effective... How was it effective? If it wasn't effective, how was it effective? And the reason why I'm pr uh, pr pr proposing these questions is what happens is now um, separating, like, like the story is not personal. Like, now I can see the story as a separate 
entity, and we can all just work on the story. So that way it gives you freedom to be candid however you want to be about, like, you know what, this is what happened in the story that didn't work for me and why the third act or that third act moment didn't work, or this is why it did work. So with that said, um, I'm going to go with Dave. I'm going to go right, right in the middle there, Dave, so people can see you before the books fall on your head. So <laughs> I'm so happy you started with me too, by the way. <laughs> oh, no, you don't want that. <laughs> no pressure, go, for go for it, Dave. No, no, I, I like being the guy that sets the pace. Okay. I always, I, I always prefer to be that, be that guy. Um, so real quick, uh, just a note with something you just said, you know, Scott, about how they always go right to the third act. And the reason, uh, there's two things that I, I found as to why they, they most likely go to the third act. Uh, number one is if there is a third act problem, there's a first act problem mm -hmm. because everything is, is built from the first act into the second and then into the third. Uh, so usually if the third act isn't working, something wasn't set up in the first act. Uh, and also, you know, something that I've learned too from, uh, from Jen Grassani is if, if you ever are just completely, you know, writing a story and, you know, you want to make it really impactful and hard-hitting and get the whole story just really moving along, you take your third act climax and put that as your inciting incident. So hmm. now everything is completely, now you have to, everything's been anteed up. Um, and uh, now, so you want me, would you like me to start with a third act? Yeah, like, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be like, it doesn't have to be so structured in terms of this meeting, but I'm going to try to okay. give it some structure. I want to be able to give the audience some tools so they come away with it. So it, I just didn't want people to, to like get together with friends and go, "Hey, just read my script. What do you think?" And then ha and not having like sort of effective note taking or effective um, processes mm -hmm. in place to help push the story forward. And it also trying to get the writer to separate themselves personally from their work, like you know, just you know, I, I'm I'm totally comfortable like separating myself and going all right tell me why this story this story it's not my story now it's like give I gave birth to a story why isn't the story working or why is it working so now you're free to cuz the the goal is like tell me what did I meet that moment in the third act and if so what did I do in the second act to tease us about that moment you're right and what about the first act did I set it up correctly or not correctly but anyway go ahead dave what was your opinions or or your gut reaction of helping push the story better or, or give us more clarity. Okay, so, uh, you know, starting with the third act, you know, we're talking about transforming the protagonist, transforming the audience, and then they can see that change. Uh, you know, usually it's it's uh, a, a prelude with a dark night of the soul. Usually at the bottom of act two, you know, the our hero is sort of uh, has expanded all of their resources, and they've either they either are at a you know uh, a, a dead end, the or the villain has has beaten them, or some kind of you know area where they they have pretty much nothing. Um, I don't know if we hit that hard enough in the in this script. Um, I did. Uh, I, I have the script in front of me, by the way. I don't have the page number, unfortunately, but I do know uh, there there was a point where um, where our main character Sarah. Was you know attack you know the point where she is attacked by her her grandmother, uh, she's also attacked she also is pulled in and we see Ada, and you know there's this whole you know uh, fight between these two, but I don't know if there was ever a point prior to that battle, because uh, usually the third act starts you know it, it, it is what that what that final battle is I don't know if there was a point before that where Ada was sort of at a crossroads I know that uh, now again I know in the house. Uh, you know, she tried to get it out, and she was running around trying to sort of, you know, find a way out. I know she did find her uh, her sister, and uh, I know there was, a, there was a point where her sister saved her, but I don't know if there was a if there was ever a point where she was transformed with the power, so to speak. Um, it, it's, it's sort of almost like if we were listening to Chris Vogler grabbing the sword, hmm. and you know, I, I'm thinking uh, in my head. I mean, I know at the end. You know, uh, she is. I, I believe she shoots that that light, and she does have the help of the two the two twin ghosts. But uh, what I'm trying to say is, Scott, I don't know if it came together. I think I mm -hmm. think there's 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 pieces in there, but I'm not sure if they were sort of put in the right order. If that if that makes any sense, or maybe I, maybe I didn't. Uh, maybe I I wasn't identifying with those moments as, as much as I should have been. Uh, you know what I mean, and I, yeah. I think there there definitely is you know a sequence. Um, and if I could, I just wanted to sort of jump back into 
to you know as I was taking notes too uh, when I was reading this, you know in, in Act One, uh, to me the whole movie starts on page uh, 40, 43. I'm sorry. Uh, what? No, it's kidding. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Forty-three. It's like uh, a ninety-page awesome. script. <laughs> well, really, because, the movie starts at page eighty-seven for me, Scott. So <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the reason it starts on forty-three is is that's where Sarah, you know, actually, you know, says the Ada chant three times. And it's soon after that that she realizes she, that she has a problem, and she can't run away from that problem, because prior to that, uh, there, at least I couldn't find a, a problem that that was that she couldn't ignore. Because usually the inciting incident happens, mm -hmm. the the hero is gradually locked into this conflict, and they either have to fight or they have to try to run or something. And, and in our case, you know, uh, Sarah gets locked in her in her uh, in her house. Both her parents are away. Uh, that's when her dad rushes home, and meanwhile she's fighting the you know uh, fighting the the uh, Ada controlling her dead grandmother, and you know she's pulled into that Ada dimension, that Ada world, and um, you know that so so from 43 to the rest, I mean I think that's sort of like your the 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 main crux of this whole story, uh, you know, and I think basically what in my opinion going from one uh, page one all the way to 43 is a lot of backstory. Um, because again, you know, we talk about her father, we talk about her dead twin sister, uh, we talk, uh, you know, again, we see the dog owner, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things going on there. Uh, but, I mean, and, and to me, this is adding a backstory to the, the, what you're doing. Uh, I, I mean, you know, there's, there's been some 70s horror movies that did something like this where, you know, there'd be a, a very slow burn and they're not necessarily having the inciting incident on page 17 and they just let it they let you you know take up this whole world and then they would put the inciting incident in uh, I want I, I don't want you to in my opinion Scott I wouldn't want you to give an answer right now I want you just to think about this stuff and just sort of meditate on all this and just sort of take it all in and then as you you know as you're gradually thinking about the story all over again you can start to sort of pull what you want and what you don't want if you know what I mean yeah, let me get a tissue right now. I got something in my <laughs> eye. No, it's kidding. <laughs> it's kidding. Hey, Dave, Dave, what page? What page is when she says um, the three things in the in the mirror? Is that page uh, forty three? Uh, forty three. Uh, it's in the uh, tree. Uh, under the tree, she says that. Yeah, that's page forty three. Okay, let me. I, I'm I'm ready whenever you you, you go for it, Alex. Uh, all right. So, um, are you sitting down, Scott? No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I can separate myself from this um, thing. So, the, the, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start. I think one of the biggest problems is I agree with Dave completely that I had notes basically saying that the beginning is way too loose, way too too much um, backstory, um, and the story just needed to be tightened. I think it was just. Um, and I don't want to use the word mirandering, but it kind of just kind of was like, just kind of wandering, wandering, and you don't grab the audience. You do at the very, I think if I, and again, I wrote, I read the script last week, Scott, so please forgive me. <laughs> but I know the very beginning there's, uh, if I remember correctly, there was an act, like not an action sequence, but a, something that scared the hell out of people, right? Yeah, it's like, it's the classic, you know, yeah. like the first seven minutes is supposed to like set up. Like right, so I remember that, that and yeah. that worked. But then after that, you just sit and wait and wait for something to happen. And there's just a lot of talking and talking and talking, and it just didn't kind of build the characters up at all. I, I think one of the biggest notes I have in the whole story is I really only care about one person, and I only care about Sarah. I don't care about anybody else, which is a major problem. You need to create, um, you need to create better relationships with the other characters uh, in general. But having that that inciting incident essentially at page 43 is death as you as you know as you know it's a death of a story i think you definitely need to bring that inciting incident back to page 20 to 25 um, and and get it started around there because you can't wait till page you can't wait, you can't expect an audience to wait till 40 minutes in give or take for the inciting incident um, and i'm not going to compare this to twilight but uh, and it's nothing like Twilight, but one of the biggest problems I had with that fucking movie was was the villain showed up in the last 20 fucking minutes and we had no idea who he was prior. And I'm like, what the hell is this crap? But 
Um, it's not that bad. So you're better than Twilight, so that's good. <laughs> so hopefully you'll make even a quarter of that money. Um, but I honestly, I think if you move that back forward, mm -hmm. uh, back a bit, tighten things up. And that was like, I just keep seeing notes and notes again of what I wrote down. Tighten, tighten, tighten. It's still very, very, it's a very loose script. So it just needs to be really condensed and really more econ more economical with the words and what each moment is doing for the story, as far as moving in for as as far as moving it forward, um, the other uh, the other big note I have. Well, I mean, I, I have notes around the whole story, but yeah. that's the beginning. As far as the third act is concerned, um, why? Uh, and and please remind me if I'm if I might be wrong on this. Has Sarah said anything about these dreams or these episodes to anybody in the story? No, and I think that's a, probably a lot of the the coming from writing a story knowing like originally it all started with like what happens if a 12 year old girl is alone in her house when the power goes off and she's attacked by a, an evil spirit so sure. every everything's based off this concept of the extreme you know the world of no budget micro budget world of like I got this girl alone and that kind of but stuff. it doesn't she, happen all never, in one night no it, it's obviously That's as the story develops but she never you know never confesses to anybody because uh, so that I think is a huge hole because, you know, unless something happens or unless you, you, you create a, a, a an instant where if she says something, something else, you have to give her a reason not to say something. If that's a main story point, whether the the ghost or or the spirit threatens the fa her family if she says anything, something something to make sense. Because right now, you're in that kind of why are you going into that dark room? And why are we splitting up right now <laughs> in this dark abandoned castle? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. those cliche horror cliches that might have worked in the 80s, but now everyone's so sophisticated that we we'll go, well, why hasn't the girl said something? So I think that's a really big hole. And so you have to tighten, you have to close that hole with something. Either have her say something to somebody else uh, or not. I, I know that you you killed a child in this movie, right? Well, no. There's um the, the the only deaths that happen in this thing are at uh, Heather is like you know 16 dies at the beginning, okay. and then um Dylan who we meet at the beginning who sort of dared her yeah, dies. he dies near the end. So um, how old is it, Dylan? He's 17, 18. Rough man. It's a rough. It's rough. When I read that, I remember going. Just maim them. Don't kill them, man. I, I, don't, I don't know. It just, it just isn't because you connect to them. The girl that dies at the beginning, you have no real connection to. Mm -hmm. But you have a connection to Dylan. When you kill a character like that off, you, I think you might lose the audience. So you can hurt him badly, but I wouldn't kill him because what is the, what is the purpose of his death in moving the story forward? Is it, is it a big sacrificial thing? Is it something that you've built up? Because when you kill a character off like that, there has to be a reason for it. If not, it's just like, well, I'm just going to slap the audience in the face because I, I want to kill this kid. So I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't kill Dylan uh, at the end. I remember that was a really kind of thing for me. I was like, wow, the kid. Anytime you kill it, and I know he's 17, he's a teenager, and we've all seen teenagers die. He's 18, 19. Yeah. 18, oh, I have 19, 20. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> if he's 18, he's of age, then he yeah, should yeah, die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yes. Uh, <laughs> But I just found it that it, it didn't do anything for the story, Interesting. Uh, regardless. And yeah. it's a character that you've you've walked with a little bit in this movie, so I would I personally wouldn't kill him. You can maim him, you can cut his leg off, have him a have him limp <laughs> for the rest of his life. I don't care. But just the killing is the thing, especially when there's a child in in you know you, you're talking about a 12 year old in this. I, I just found it weird. I just found it very weird and and, and off putting for me, unless again. It's something like Poltergeist or something like that. That it, it, it works within the story structure. This just seemed to come out of left field for me when I was reading that. Um, right. And then, uh, and one other, just one general big note is one scene should lead into another faster. Like I said, which is that general note of tightening everything up. Mm -hmm. I just think it, it again, everything's a bit loose. Um, the whole Bob and Bill thing um, is that third act or is that second act? It's kind of into the second act. So, so, so it was supposed to design as sort of the B story, you know, uh -huh. um, about the father's like the father's sin, uh, you know, setting him up to, to live at that house, to not really pay attention to his 
the, his daughter in that respect. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, his coming to realization is that was sort of the B story, but also help, um, I guess, with, you know, exposition and to some extent, the backs, like, the the backstory of Ada, because um, no way would uh, Sarah on her own figure it out, like what the you know what the story was. At least that's how I I wrote it. Obviously, it's not working, but uh, that was a, that was sort of the the intention of the Bob and Bill um, relationship slash you know comic relief within this. I found that the Bob and Bill scenes really bothered me. Uh, they didn't do they didn't do anything for me, and I found them. Um, I found the setting very uninspired in as far as like we're in cubicles, we've got a young boss. It just seemed it just didn't ring really interesting to me. So it just seemed like it's a dead space. If you need to get that exposition in having like and I know this is not this kind of movie, but what Cameron does every time James Cameron does every time he needs exposition, he does it within an action sequence or something else so there's not it's there's more movement. So if you and God remember if you remember Terminator, my God, the exposition in that movie. <laughs> um, but he did most of the exposition of that movie while the Terminator is chasing them. And then, like, Michael Bean and, and Linda Hamilton are talking to each other while they're being run. What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. And the action, she's, so you're doing it in a car chase. Again, that's not this kind of story. But, but that's a great technique that maybe you should implement in creating a backstory in a more interesting environment uh, and create a little bit more movement, more action than a bunch of cubicles because it just sits like a lump of crap there and just, just sits there. Like, uh, it just, it's like I'm going to now give you backstory and that's death again for for a story and a screenplay so I would definitely see what you can do to kind of make that work a little bit better and then the whole comic relief thing just doesn't fly and I think maybe a lot of that has to do with the environment I think you maybe and I know maybe it's because you have access to uh, yeah. ghost cubicles exactly you, yeah. but, <laughs> but to create maybe another environment or find another environment that's a little bit more not only visually interesting but keeps things moving a little bit more, and I think uh, I think Dave said it earlier. It's like there's there's this kind of lacking of m movement in the movie in the story. It's just very kind of like I'm going to talk here, I'm going to talk here, I'm going to talk here. Okay, we're going to walk over here and I'll talk over here, talk over here, talk. And we're going to there's not like this energy. There's no kinetic energy to the story where it has the potential. To have a lot of that, because I actually do like the story. I actually like the the whole mythology of what you've created, and it's it's an original. I haven't seen, I, no, nor do I see a, a tremendous amount of, because God knows there's a thousand horror movies every minute. Yeah. But um, from <laughs> my from my point of view, that's anything that's hit the mainstream. I've never seen anything like this. I like this idea, and I think the idea has a lot of potential. Um, but I think the 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 kinetic energy of of the story needs to be really ramped up in today's world as far as the whole just the storytelling process is concerned yeah very cool so you uh, you brought up Bill and I'm gonna get to Jason here because Jason and I had talked uh, before uh, about this story and he brought up and Jason's you know way brutal too no, I'm just gonna hear. <laughs> I expect nothing less from Bob. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, yeah so here he comes oh, I mean, he's here he's here Waiting. he's coming he's coming so to answer your question about the Dylan role of having him uh, uh, be killed in the third act um, it was interesting enough, it was, you know, in Blake Snyder's book, Save the Cat, he has this, like, the outline of, like, the monster in the house sort of genre, and he talked about, like, the half man. Like, there's usually in these stories is, like, someone who survived the monster, um, in Quint, in, um, Jaws, you know, in, uh, The Shining, the, uh, the, uh, the one who had Brady, The Shining, Brady, Brady, Brady. right. He died. So I was like, well, who could be that person? And so I developed Dylan to be that person. It's interesting because all that stuff sort of fits into like a formula or too much of a structure. And when Jason uh, and I had talked, he was like, man, sometimes you just got to, like, that's the problem. Like, you're fitting it all into these boxes. You're not just, you're, not, you're no longer writing a story. So, uh, Jason, um, you've heard all this stuff before. Again, so... Um, as you fall down, it sounds like you just fell down. Are you are you okay? Has something fallen? Has Sorry, something I'm fallen I'm I'm trying to keep my iPad as uh, you know as still as possible. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we can hear you. So yeah, let's 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 continue or like uh, sh kind of. Whatever your thoughts are, you've all you've heard all this stuff before. We've had the conversation, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago about this story. Um, 
if you want to reiterate or give your two cents about the sort of the third act transformation, why it's not working, you know, how how do I make that moment um, more impactful, you know, uh, that an audience would care and would feel like they got their money's worth. So, well, I think the best thing, since I unfortunately I'm in a situation where I'm a little bit distracted, so I'm going to try and do the best that I can. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me. I'm I'm actually going to take it in a little, slightly different direction because I I've, I've been writing some notes here. Um, there are about ten main things that I wanted to discuss, um, and I'm just gonna. There's no real order here. Uh, the first thing was the talking in exposition, and what I felt like when I was like listening to most of the dialogue throughout this was that it wasn't actual dialogue. Most of it was like, let me explain to you about this thing, and then let me explain to you about that thing, and I'm gonna let's you know, it wasn't really how a way to like get us interested in the characters by what they would actually say. It was more like, okay, um, I'm trying to set this up, and then I'm going to try to set that other thing up, you know. So, um, and even though it was kind of hidden a little bit, it still just, just kind of felt like a lot of things were being explained, especially in the first act. Um, so that was one topic. The second one is, like Alex was saying, is just really tightening things up a lot and getting it to the point where, like, for example, let's take the first scene where the girl's going to the tree. All the th you're, you know, in the first act, what you really want to try to do is get us into the story as quickly as possible and then hook us in so that we want to know what's going to happen for the next two hours. And, it, you know, it's really difficult to do that now because everybody's seen every movie. Everything's been done. Yeah, and you, you really want to have something original and something that like is going to pull people um, beyond all that resistance that I think people have to sitting there. They, they, you know, that has to be established really early. So if you watch, you know, movies that do this well, they really super compress the first act as much as possible so that you can get into that second act of wanting to know what's going to happen next. What you know, the main conflict of the story, or the the A and B stories, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I also agree. I think a lot of the kind of comic moments are just kind of like, okay, shut up. Let's get to the story. Why do I care about these people? Why do I care about this story? I don't want to hear a lot of kind of banter between them being cute, the husband being cute, the kind of, you know, and I'm going to go back to the Bob and Bill thing. <laughs> you can't name these guys the similar names because I could not tell who was Bob and who was Bill and I kept getting... <laughs> And it was a complete like maybe you know, maybe, I'm dumb. maybe better names too. Bob and Bill are just very generic. Yeah, I always whenever I write, I try to name people something that kind of is a little bit like their personality, you know, or even name them like nicknames, you know, because that'll stick with you a little bit more. But you never you don't want to get somebody reading a screenplay and have them get confused because that that'll kind of kill their energy from continuing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. All right. Um. There's a lot of moments that I felt like are very similar to other movies, and when you do that, you run into the risk of people just kind of being like, oh, yeah, I saw this is the same thing that happened in The Ring, or this is the same thing that happened in whatever, and it's just like um, you want to avoid that as much as possible, and, and a lot of times that comes in later acts. You know, If you do a first act, and sometimes you're trying to just you're, you're, you even say to yourself, okay, well, this is kind of a scene like something that happened in Jaws or something that happened in Terminator or something else. You know, temporarily it's okay to be cliche or to be, you know, derivative of something else. But you always want to try to look for a new and original way to, to tell it so that people don't get ahead of you. You know, so a lot of the scenes, even like the first scene, there's parts of Candyman, there's parts of a lot of different movies that are kind of like put into one movie. And I think that sometimes even like subconsciously after you've written, ideas will start coming into your head about, oh, well, I could do that in a different way, you know, and to try to even, you know, compress it and tell it in a way that nobody's ever seen. You know, as a writer, your job is to kind of, you know, generate new and fresh kind of ideas. Um, are you guys still with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're here, we're here, man. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I just—I literally wrote this in my kid's desk in crayon, so I'm sitting here. Okay. So, wow. Wow. <laughs> there's a dinosaur on here. Okay, conflict. Well, I mean, Scott, Scott, and I have already talked about this a bunch. <laughs> yes. Conflict. Um, 
in the in the scenes between the characters, you would really benefit from causing creating more conflict between your characters, between the wife, between you know, like we had talked about um, with Sarah, if they were trying to kind of hide something from her, if you could create tension in the relationships, it's going to make it a lot more interesting between them. So if you have your two, you know, the the um, the husband and the wife are arguing about stuff, or maybe not even arguing, but you just put in put some scenes in there where it demonstrates that there's tension between them. Maybe, that maybe there's trouble in their marriage. Maybe there's trouble with something or whatever. And may, you know, there should be some sort of tension between each one of your characters that at some point kind of comes comes to the surface. You know, like stuff that's just bubbling up, and you just, and all those little things you want to have with you know your story to make sure that people are. You know, dramatic tension is the most important thing at really sucking people into that world, you know. Yeah. Um, so lots more conflict. Uh, the overall concept is something that I think you want to definitely get to quicker so people understand, okay, what is this movie about? What is the concept? If you could watch, like, think to yourself what, um, what the trailer would look like, you know, and what the trailer would offer that – would really make people say, you know, I, I want to see this. I got to know what's going to happen or what, you know. And I don't think that's really established until, you know, much later, like um, Dave page was 43. saying. Yeah, page, page 43. Yeah. Page 43. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> so that is another one. Okay. Du, 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 du. Also, the co compression of time is very important. So, you know, you can do things a lot quicker. Certain things that you do, you know, scenes that kind of go on and on and on, you could do in like 30 seconds, you know, compressing that time, making sure that all those moments that don't need to be long are, are very cut down because whenever you're dealing with horror, you're going to have moments where you've got somebody walking with a flashlight, you've got something going on that you're going to want to drag out and you're going to want to, you know, make that as long as possible. And then the scenes that don't have that, you want to kind of just, make them only as long as they need to be. So there was a lot of scenes that was like, you know, driving in the car, going to the hospital in the beginning and stuff that I felt like, okay, this could have been a lot quicker. Um, and like, what is the point of this scene? And, and you got to think also in terms of a producer, you know, I got to shoot all this stuff. So do I really need this or is this going to end up on the editing room floor? You know? Yeah. Um, okay. Compression of time. I always said it was too PG. So the, you know, the beginning where the kids are all at the tree that I said they should all be drinking and they should all be more, you know, rated R. <laughs> uh, I mean, if it's going to be like a real horror movie, I definitely think you want to make stuff more, you know, um, a little more dangerous and a little more, uh, less saccharine. Like the kids the kids are a little, yeah. The kids are a little more like middle school than you know in the way they act. Because kids that I know that are in high school are a lot more savvy, um, and they would be like out drinking by the tree. And I, I had said something I think about um, what's the girl's name, Natalie, at the beginning. Heather dies. Heather. Yeah. I, you know about you know there's I think there's different ways to put that scene together so that it would work a little bit better. You know that you know she was kind of shy and they were all drinking and she's like fine I'm gonna drink and. You know, just the, the people's reasons for doing things need to be a lot more clear. You know, you need to be like, okay, um, somebody who gets fed up and does something out of anger, or do, you know, the motivations behind the actions need to, to be clear to the audience, you know? Yeah. Um, and the last thing is really, well, I also have the, the theory of each scene starting kind of with a mystery, the action of the... Um, the people in the scene, and then the resolution and the conflict that, that comes out of that action. So I really feel like there needs to be more, mis like little mini movies within the movie. So when you're watching a scene, um, there needs, on the part of the audience, we need to be like, oh, what's going on? What's coming next? What is that? Why, you know, and being in front of the audience and not letting them in, kind of not really putting things in front of them that they can figure out so easily. And, you know, taking away a lot of information, not giving them things that they, you know, that they can use to figure it out. You know, it's like Roman Polanski. He's like, don't tell people what's going on. You know, confuse them. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to things like the Bill and uh, Bob thing, um, that's just confusing in terms of something. You know, that's a different kind of confusing. <laughs> yeah, gotcha.
But you know, just be aware of where the audience is. You know, with everything you're taking, you're basically in front of the, you know, the amusement park, and you say, okay, we're going to go here now, and then we're, gonna, you know, and you've got to kind of have them in your pocket and like, you know, have them exactly where you want them. You know, and say, where is the audience now? What do they know? What information do they have? And what, where are they going to? Um, what conclusion are they going to have on that? Is it, is it too obvious what's going to happen next? And sometimes you have to kind of surprise yourself, you know. Like when you uh, – I was just reading the thing with um, – when I was driving from uh, Tennessee, I was listening to Kevin Smith's book. Um, and he was talking about when he was writing Red State, which isn't like a, the example, best example, but he would say anytime he knew what was going to happen next, he would completely change gears, you know. And I I, I never saw it, but I don't I don't know if it worked or not. Yeah, it was but, you know, yeah, it was like a, whenever, it was a good he, film. whenever he got in front of it, whenever he knew what was going to happen, he would have to change it. And you, you know, one of the biggest things that I've dealt with with writing as well, and this is something that actually Rob said, was that if you're not feeling the emotions that you want the audience to feel, you know, if you're not crying, if you're not scared, if you're not all these other things, then it's not working yet. So you you always have to ask yourself, you know, am I scared? Does this scare me? Or does this make me happy or sad or whatever? Yeah. So anyway, yeah. I'm I'm gonna shut up now because people just walked in. <laughs> okay. And I'm gonna find another room, so I'm gonna turn off my thing. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. So um, it's interesting because, uh, like, normally if the story, let's say, was working, but it was a little bit more um, further down the line in drafts, you know, we could use this this concept of the third act, like. Is that moment, that transformation moment, impactful? Is it, is the payoff worth it? And then we would go back to the second act and just find two parts uh, within the, the second act that teased us that this moment was going to happen. And then we would go back to the first act and the, the setting it all up, like um, knowing that that's where we're going to end up in the third act. And and I was trying to present the protagonist as the, the extreme opposite of where she ends up in the third act, which is why she's suffering from an asthma attack, you know, um, you know, she's having visions or what looks like visions of, you know, ghostly things that are happening to her, um, so that when she eventually hits the third act and she's staying there strong and literally, you know, vanquishing a... a, a this, this entity that actually can kill you know the living a living soul. Um, I wanted to see that that flip, but that's what the the concept was. And obviously we see that it's not there yet. And so I guess the big question here is like this has to come back to the concept part of it, which is I'm gonna since looking at time wise too. Um, one of the questions like I would want you guys to ask me would be like, why did I want to tell this story? What is my personal connection with the story, and what is missing that would make this story great? And I know that that's what Jason was alluding to. Was I remember when we had a discussion about this, and he kind of hinted there a little bit. Was after he read it, is it like I think he could tell, he could see through the facade and saying, "Why are you writing this story? Like, what is your personal connection to this story?" And I was curious from your guys' perspective, you, uh, Dave and Alex, like. What are are there kernels in there that you see that could be that could feel more like a personal story? Like I, you know, I I'm just trying to make the, this thing the best thing I can. So I, I'm just curious what your your thoughts are. I'm gonna go to Alex. Well, um, Scott, first of all, what? Let me ask you that question. What is the purpose <laughs> of you trying to make? Why are you making this movie? Because I I you know I everybody here knows that I'm in the middle of editing my first feature film, and there's a specific reason why I made that story and why it's coming from me and it's not just some thing that I'm tossing out there just to say I made a movie it's something very personal to me so what is the reasoning for this movie for you why do you want to tell the story that's a good point a good question that <laughs> <it's funny. laughs> let me let me give you the question that I want you to give me back <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no i there there is a scene in the movie where there's a television screen going on and i always what was interesting to me was um uh, like horror for horror, like the like the sort of the campy, schlocky, gore stuff. Mm. It's not my my cup of tea, but I I really love uh, supernatural or paranormal stories that deal with the questions of afterlife and other dim other dimensions or other things outside of our physical world. And so this concept of 
a, a, a girl that was a Siamese twin who had a Siamese a, a twin that was attached to her that uh, was underdeveloped and who died, the, the question is, what happens to the soul? And so then the, this whole thing about cloning, you know, when you clone a sheep or a cow or eventually a person, what happens to the soul? Is it created? Do they have their own? And that's why it was interesting when they looking into the study of that, which was that, um, you know, nature has its own way of cloning, which is twins. And twins, each one of them has their own soul. And so the, I always thought it was fascinating that if a surviving twin that was really, literally, you know, connected via, uh, uh, you know, uh, conjoined twin um, situation, had some sort of supernatural paranormal connection to her her sisters passed on um, that when a evil entity from another you know dimensional realm came to try to attack someone who may have this wild card factor like someone who who who's a who can transcend in that world to either protect or defeat them backup I, yeah <laughs> yeah 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 She's got backup. <laughs> oh, backup. Oh, that's what you said. Back. I thought you. I thought you were saying no, 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 no. You back up. You're right. No, backup. no, no. That she's got backup. She's got backup. It, got... It's, it was the wild card thing that the the vengeful spirit did not count on. That some human or physical being would have a connection to the spirit world or the other world to be a challenge or a fight. Anyhow, so that was at the kernel of this, what this story was. That was what interested me. And so I was like, well, what can I explore that question more? Like. What mm -hmm. if someone could walk around and have um, – it's sort of a heightened version of those people that are psychics or mediums that can see, but it's like really, you know, done in, you know, in a story. We're telling a story, so it's like this dramatic or, you know, a more action-adventure type thing. I was just really curious about that because I would, I would study or research about people's experiences about – did you see your sister or your, you know, your grandma? People that are connected to their family members, and knowing that my my father passed away recently, this question of like, you know, dawns upon me. Like, you hear about these stories of people are are they still around to some extent? If if you get into that, I don't say metaphysical or this concept of what is that other realm uh, of the spirit world um, that I can tap into? So that's sort of where it all started, and I wanted to tell a story around that concept. Um, but I think I might have added too much, obviously, too much stuff. But, but, but emotionally, I think what I wanted was I wanted the third act to end up being that you really felt for this girl uh, where she's not alone, where you felt that she's connected to her sister in a you know a different state, obviously. Like, but she's ha she's but she's got this growth from it, and um, and. Yeah, so, so that's sort of it. I just wanted to see, and as a parent, I wanted to have a movie where the worst case scenario, we're like, okay, this is our first time we're leaving our child alone for the house for a couple hours. You know, like, what's the worst could happen? That's honestly, <laughs> honestly that's sort of where it started from. It's like, you know, like, what, what, what's the worst could happen if, um, you know, you leave a kid at home while well, they attack by a, a demon, you know, or something. <laughs> so that, I, that right there, I think, is something that you need to focus on because I've had that question when I was a kid. And I had all my, I had never, at that point when I was a kid, I had never had any deaths in my family. And when I saw a scary movie, I'm like, shit, I'm out of luck. But when my <laughs> grandparents died, I'm like, oh, I got some backup now. Like, in, if some shit goes down, Grandpa and Grandma are gonna come and help me out, you know. If I get attacked by a ghost or spirit, I, I like how would why wouldn't they? They did it in life. This is the 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 mindset of a child, um, and that's a great concept. It's a great idea to kind of venture that out. But you've taken it to the next level with this, uh, you know, Siamese twin and that Siamese twin. But yeah, it's Siamese twin, but a twin and and that whole process. And then you even threw Grandma into a poor Grandma, uh, and you threw all of this into it. So that I think is muddled with yeah. all this other crap you've thrown in there. And I think you've got to kind of really hone in on that because that is a poster. That is a trailer like that everyone can relate to. Like if you get attacked by a spirit or yeah. a ghost from another world or from beyond, would your dead relatives come and help you? 
Yeah. Like that's a great idea. It's a great concept, and you've taken it with this with the twin sister a- a- angle of it, as opposed to grandpa coming after it. But I think if you establish the relationship between the sisters a bit more, in whatever way you can, build that relationship up as much as you can at the beginning. So when she does show up, um, it makes sense. But I really think that's a great idea. That's a great concept. But you've got to strip down all this other crap that you've thrown in there. Mm-hmm. And you've got to just stick to to the story. And may I add, don't don't try to you don't have to get a secondary story outline. You don't have to you don't have to do another uh, you know uh, a parallel storyline with like Bob and Bill and all this yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. You could just stay with Sarah, you know, and just stick with her the entire movie. And just be with her the whole movie. You don't have to make yourself more complicated. Make this as straight, a clean, a simple like simplicity is always the best a lot of times and, and not getting too complex. Because nobody at this at this brain trust right now has the experience or the decades of, you know, a Joe Hest- Esther House or mm-hmm. a Shane Black or these guys who've made you know a million screenplays who understand story like it's water. We don't know that, so I think that you trying to make it even more complicated, you're you're, you're creating again barriers for yourself. I think you should just stick to that great story, and just stick to that, and just follow this girl along her path, and and if you could stick to that that one concept, would a relative from the past or that has passed on come and help me if shit goes down metaphysically, uh, or you know ghostly. Mm-hmm. That's a great and powerful selling tool for a story. Like it. Hey, Dave, yeah, you, I, your thoughts? That's been real quick. Oh, no, um, Jason. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> the voice Screw you, on. Dave. Hold on, Dave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got to get to Dave fast. Before is, is, that, is that somebody oh. from beyond the, beyond the Realm? Is, is that somebody from... <laughs> Hello, <laughs> everyone. That is scary. Buff is a ghost. Jesus. I want... <laughs> I would haunt you, Ferrari. <laughs> I know you would, sir. You bought me already, sir. I see you everywhere on Facebook, sir. Everywhere. Just as I wanted. Okay, so let me just make one one thing. You know, I completely agree with what Alex is saying, and I, I want to say, you know, just after I was obsessed with structure for a really long time because when I used to write back, you know, back in the '60s when I was a writer, <laughs> you know. You know, me and Billy Wilder. You know, I'd be throwing back, you know, gin and tonics with the kids. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, no, but I mean, you know, there's so much of this, like, oh, you got to have this beast, you know, the save the cat stuff and the whole, you know, hero's journey and whatever and, and all this stuff that, you know, I've gotten to the point now where I think that's so counterproductive when it comes to focusing on, okay, what is your story? What really is something that you you know, want to tell that is like you have a passion about. You're really like, you know, just and don't look at it like okay, it has to be 90 pages or it has to be 100 pages or it has to be a screenplay format or or whatever form it takes. It's just like okay, tell me a story that's really good. It can be an hour long, it can be 15 minutes or whatever, and then find what that. I mean, half of writing is is just finding what the story is. What is it? I mean, there's obviously something that you want to tell here. That's not quite getting out, and I think it's like you know Alex is saying it's getting muddled because you're trying to fit it into the format of a different kind of movie. It's like your movie is going to be unique. It's not going to be like any other movie, but you're kind of taking little bits and pieces of other movies and trying to kind of do like a Frankenstein, you know. And you want to avoid that. You have an, a unique original voice. You're very creative, and you know you shouldn't be. Looking to other people to tell your story, you should find, you know, figure out what it is, and just say, hey, okay, I'm going to tell, you know, a story to my daughter, and I'm going to tell my a story to my friend or something, and like think of it in terms of just the trailer. What is just the trailer? What is just the, you know, you can say like the log line or what is what, but what is the story about? If you had to make it into like a short short film, what would that be? You know, but there's a there's a original idea here that you need to kind of just define. You know, you've got kind of the lump of clay and you've got it kind of there, but there's obviously something that you are trying to get out that you're you're kind of going in different directions. And I've done the same thing. It's like when you start writing, you know, you want to fill it in, you want to make it interesting for people, and that sometimes can distract from the overall idea that you're going for. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Hey Dave, what do you got? 
I re- Jason, that was fantastic. I I just want to make sure um, um, I respectful yeah. of everybody's time, and then get get you out. <laughs> it's okay. So, um, okay. So so I guess I'll just close this out. Um, I I think you should definitely go back to the concept stage. Um, and evaluate and evolve that, uh, and and just see if there's anything else that you could sort of take with this concept, and just see if you could up it any at all. You know what I mean? Just brainstorming the concept. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of good points to the script. Uh, one thing I would take out though is the is there are a lot of humor aspects. Uh, I don't think that would work too well with the with the with the comedy and then the horror. Um, because when I was doing stuff like that, like I wrote a screenplay um, about, a, I won't tell you what it was about, but it was, it was a comedy. It was a comedy horror, and the number one critique was like people were like, "Well, one minute it's a legitimate laugh out loud, and then the next minute we're like we're we're you know seeing somebody get disemboweled, and is it kind of like Tucker and Daryl versus Evil, or are we trying for something like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein?" Uh, which is a which is two very different tones, and they're both horror comedies. Mm, yeah. Um, and I have a ton of other notes, but I I don't think you know we probably have done the time. Um, but uh, but you know that that's just on my notes, and 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 I agree with Buff. Um, you know, I if I I mean I, if I were you, I would just take the concept, and what I do now is I I just sort of, you know. I, I think sometimes story structure can be as helpful as it is harmful. It can be a double-edged sword sometimes. Uh, sometimes I think it can be very helpful, and sometimes I think we try to fit things into a paradigm that might not be the exact story that we need to tell with this, or it might not fit our idea. Uh, you know, because I think a lot of these paradigms come from the necessity of they want to just make sure they make a hit movie. You know what I mean? They want to make sure... And I've tried all the paradigms, believe me. Um, I, I mean, you know, this 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 whole thing right here is nothing but film. This is the film library right here. Uh, Save the Cats on there. Chris Baldwin's books on there. Uh, you know, and don't every sne- other... Don't sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? From beyond. <laughs> but um, but uh, that's pretty much all of my, my main notes. I mean, I just, I just made a couple other notes here and there. But um, but I, I think if you if you took the same concept, maybe make Sarah a, a bullied kid at school. She has no friends, uh, and you know, here and and even if you make the spirit like Ada friendly to her, and you know maybe even has and and maybe Ada just you know she's friendly to Sarah, but she's actually out there trying to get Sarah to kill kids for her. Uh, I know Alex. I know Alex is probably gonna say. Uh, he doesn't like that idea, but um, no. <laughs> he's like, what? But, I make fun. <laughs> no, 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 because we were talking about killing kids earlier. Oh well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but we always talk about speaking. Yeah. When you kill kids on screen, mm-hmm. how often do you see that? If you very see, rarely, if ever. If you want to see a movie that is just out and out outlandish, where they actually kill kids on screen, it's called Beware Children at Play. And it's about the, this little group of demonic kids who are killing adults, and at the end, all the adults band together, and they just start killing these kids because they just got they got to do away with them. There was a scene in a John Carpenter movie, and I think it was the taking of Pelham One Two Three, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken, early in his career, where he shot a little girl, like an innocent, I'm literally eating ice cream, and the bad guy, one of the bad guys, just grabbed and shot her on screen. And Carpenter said, I've gone too far. When John Carpenter says, I've gone too far, <laughs> maybe we should listen. Um, but I, I, well, go ahead. Okay, how about this? Then how about if Ada has Sarah sort of uh, maybe even start killing adults? Maybe she has to, like, maybe, you know, it's, and then that way. See, I kind of think if, if Ada provided something for Sarah, and it was almost like this really. You know, there's a lore to it, and maybe you know, because you know, Ada's from this other sort of realm. But and then maybe as they get, you know, as they keep working together and playing and playing together, it's almost like Ada becomes her playmate. She say, she tries to get Sarah to do you know evil things, and that's maybe when her you know uh, eight, or, uh, Sarah's you know dead twin sister can come back. Uh, you brought it's, up. You brought it's inter- I'm sorry, because you, you you brought up an interesting thing here, because the title of the movie or the script is Ada. And in this genre, a lot of the experts say that 
you have to make your villain or your monster very memorable. Like, it has to be unique, right? So um, I think that was an interesting note you, or a concept there is, like, there, like having the protagonist, whoever it's going to be, if it's Sarah or if I rewrite this completely and, and change it up a lot, but there's, is there a connection to the need to, to have a connection to this, this vengeful spirit, you know, the curse or the, the lore or something where the stakes are, uh, are you know, risen. So I guess that's the thing, too, as like we can wrap up here, is if the name of the movie is Ada, and it's, it's designed to create... Because in this genre, you know, I'm not having... I don't have, like, you know, certain superstars. Like, it's not a star-driven thing. It's a, it's a genre-driven thing. It's, a, it's driven by the, a fear. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I may be, you know, truthfully and candidly, I, go, I'm, I may not 100% believe in the, the lore that I created for Ada yet. And that's why I wanted to have this opportunity to sort of bounce it off, this idea with you guys to say, I was trying to create a memorable villain that was simply, I'm just trying to lob it up where if this story was is is told well enough and the movie's executed properly that you know kids out and wherever they are in the world uh, late at night could just you know start screwing with themselves to to like play the Ada chant you know if they would be any tree in any place in the world and sort of this concept like uh, it's just a rip off of like Bloody Mary so you stand in front of the mirror with a candle you say Bloody Mary Bloody Mary three times because you're just you're taunting you're you're it has some yeah. purpose behind it but anyway i was curious how do i level up the villain you know how do i make the the the, the villain more memorable um you know and, and then i could tie in reason that's if i can make that threat even more uh, you know foreboding like in jaws it's straight primal it's like we know there's a real life creature out there in the water that can kill you and eat you viciously so this concept of this back the backstory of Ada to finally meet her match with uh, a girl that has the backup of the go the spirit world with his her relatives is you know that's that is the uh, I guess the the good versus evil type themes um, anyhow if, uh, if I, if yeah, I may before we go I, I just have two points I wanted to, to to finish off with one. I think with the with the main villain, if you went down the path of a Stephen King's Christine or, or Pan's Labyrinth, mm -hmm. where the creature comes or the the ghost comes or something that at, at the beginning they're they're some they're one thing, but at the end they've turned into something else. Hmm. Um, where that like I think a little bit of what Dave was talking about, like she's convincing her to do things, or she maybe is a lonely girl who's bullied and. Maybe being friends with her, she gets to beat up the bully once, or something like that, where where the ghost starts building a relationship. The bad ghost starts building up a relationship with Sarah, but her other sister maybe is coming to her dream, saying, "No, this is not good." Blah blah blah. To the end, where they have she has to confront this person who's been giving her this power all, all along, and that's probably a stronger conflict. And then having her sister come in and help. And and we have to you have to kind of you know dash her sister in throughout so it doesn't come out of left field, but something like that like when Christine you know going back a while that you know at the beginning he's a cool car that gets to he gets the chicks he gets to this and that all of a sudden he's he gets obsessed with murdering people and the car is killing people and blah 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 that's a cool idea and also Pan's Labyrinth which was a little bit more psychological of what mm -hmm. Pan was doing to the little girl. Um, I think that is much more interesting than basically a Candyman or Bloody Mary ripoff, which yeah. I think, honestly, I, I would kill. Honestly, I would kill all of that because it's just derivative. And something a little bit more psychological makes it more interesting from my point of view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the the last note is, and I know these two guys said about structure. Um, I, I do love structure. I love structure a lot. But you cannot become dogmatic with structure. I think if you're going to try to tell a movie that is going to be seen by a mass audience, I think structure, um, is, if it works for Aristotle, it's going to work for us. So there are certain points that need to be hit. Now, you can, you can be loose with that, 
but I think that structure, that hero's journey or whichever structure you want to go down, there's many of them. They all kind of – they're all the same thing. They're just different flavors of the same situation. I think that is very needed, especially in an in, in indie film um, a lot of times, especially in an indie horror movie, um, because that's what's going to help you get through or cut through the, the muck where the, a lot of these indie horror movies – they don't do stuff like that, and they just kind of miranda, and it's just there for the shock value. And you don't have horror. This is not a gore fest at all. Mm -hmm. This is not that kind of movie. So you've got to kind of go through that a little bit more. So study the structure of Halloween, of uh, Christine, of Jaws. Just start studying the structures of them, and then they're just big, you know, points that you have to like. Okay, I'm gonna go. I gotta hit there. I gotta get to the point of no return. Something has to happen here where it's a point of no return. Something has to happen here where it's inciting incident. And here's the, the, the you know, the all is lost. And, and in between there's a couple. There's, there are not a lot of points. But if you can hit, like, you know, the four or five main story points as structure is concerned, that's what I'm talking about. Not to be like, page 18, this has to happen. Page 27, this has to happen. That That's where I think you become so jammed. I got to jam this all in before page 27 kind of crap. If it takes you anywhere between page 15 and page 25 to get the inciting incident, you're good. Get out of page 43, though. But um, if, uh, <laughs> but I, but that works. And I think, at least from my point of view, that structure is extremely important, especially when writing a story like this. But I think if you go down more the psychological level uh, and bring us into Sarah's world a little bit, uh, I think that might make it a little bit more of an interesting story. Very cool, uh, Dave. Um, we'll go with you, and then we'll wrap up with Jason, and we'll we'll call it quits here. Uh, you know, just one final thought about that idea I was talking about. Maybe even have it where Ada has to get more powerful. So the more times that that Sarah sort of summons her, maybe even if you want to change the chant, maybe even make it up into like a little music box or something like that, or just something that Ada is summoned by. And Ada should be maybe even be something. Whoever sums summons Ada. That's the form she takes. So if the grandmother were to summon Ada, uh, summon Ada, it would take the form of maybe the grandfather she was trying to reach. Uh, Sarah, you know, uh, summons Ada, and she becomes this little playmate for her. Uh, it's almost like what you were really looking for. And uh, I would maybe even just that's an idea. Again, I say I always say, you know, meditate on this, uh, uh, Scott, and just see, you know, see where it goes, man. And uh, you know. Maybe take uh, all of our advice or none of our advice. Um, right, right. But, uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Hey, Jason. Are you still there? Hey, okay. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with Alex, too. When I, when I say about structure, um, you know, definitely don't feel like uh, you have to change, but structure is there to be your guide and to put the breadcrumbs in front of you so that you know more or less like if you're coming to a certain kind of part of your screenplay and you're getting a little bit lost you can say okay well okay this this is kind of what probably needs to happen next one you know the the best thing that i ever learned how to do was to you know if i was writing a screenplay and it was kind of based upon uh, a certain kind of movie i would just sit there and and watch the movie that you know, it was kind of like and, and kind of break it down so that I could see when they were hitting the beats, you know, when they were, you know, when we had gone into the second act, what was happening. And more importantly, I think, is why things are so effective. And I think when you actually sit down and watch a movie, it's different from the way that you remember it. And a lot of times you focus on the scene itself, you know, like, like we were talking about, little mini movies within the movie. So... You know, you have to make every second of your film interesting and every second something that's, you know, um, part of the overall movie. So focus on these little mini, you know, scenes, breaking your scenes down and saying, okay, why is this scene interesting? Why is this scene in there? What's the beginning of the scene, the middle? Why are, you know, who cares about this? Is this going to make an audience interested in, more interested in the characters or whatever? Um and so, you know, I think structure is absolutely a way to kind of have a, a map. You know, I don't think you should go so far as to say, oh, well, I wrote my screenplay, I'm happy, but it, it doesn't follow Save the Cat or it doesn't follow this or whatever. Um, I think that's a huge mistake. You know, I don't, I don't, Save the Cat is great, but, you know, I've talked about this a million times on the podcast. You know, it's a very specific kind of story and it's a very predictable kind of story. So, 
you know, you can also surprise yourself and have things that you didn't even know were going to come out. And and the thing that I'm, I'm getting at was um, when I write, I try to surprise myself. So if I have too much structure, then I just kind of, I'm going to write something that is like you know where it's going. And that's one of the only problems that I really have with Pixar movies is that in almost every Pixar movie, you know what's going to happen. You kind of already see the end. And that's one of the reasons I don't enjoy a lot of, you know, that aspect of the Pixar movies. They're written perfectly, but they're predictable. And you know kind of everything. You know there's going to be a resolution in the end. And you know this, you know, Pixar movies are not horror movies, you know. Um, and horror movies have a very different structure and a way of dealing with, you know, when what, thing, what things happen and what information you're given and, and whatever. Um, but not to stay on that too long, I also wanted to address one thing that Dave said that I kind of disagree with, um, and I don't disagree with, with what he was saying in terms of genre, but I absolutely believe that you need to have comedy, but not the kind of comedy that I think you're putting into the story. And when I'm talking about comedy, I'm talking about, like, for example, watching um, aspects of, like, The Sixth Sense, and I think that early in Night Shyamalan did it very well, which was having comic moments that come out of just a character and that, like, something uncomfortable or whatever, I think the best way to really make an audience um, identify with Sarah is to to have comic moments with her in the beginning and have moments not comic like, oh, you know, slip on a banana peel, Steve Martin kind of stuff, but comic moments that make us, that endear her to us, that make us say, oh, well, that's something that I do in my life or that's something, you know, oh, that's frustrating or that's, you know, and that kind of comic moment where it's just like something comes out of the character going through something frustrating. Like, for example, I mean, give it the stupidest thing you could, you know, that she cleans her room and then something happens and, and messes things up. Just little things in her daily life that makes us kind of identify with her that can be a little bit comic, but not comic, you know, like Cheech and Chong. You know what I mean? Right, right. That's well, about it. Well, awesome, you guys. Um I will wrap it up here like an hour and a half into the session. And um, I can't thank you guys enough for taking your time to just try this experiment experiment out with me. Like, let me start over. This experiment out with me. <laughs> I think uh, I always wanted to see what this, if we kind of constructed the, the story session to be this way based off all the notes I were, that I was studying about the Pixar process. And again, it's not to be a Pixar film, but I do appreciate how Pixar is able to be consistent, very consistent in what they do in their genres and also get an emotional response out of the audience, you know. Um, and I wanted to find, you know, how could I do that within a different genre, within a different um, context in terms of indie film. Um, but with all that said, you know, I'm going to go back and take the notes and take this session. And like you said, I don't have to use anything that you guys said, but just the process of doing this should help stir the, the creative juices enough to ask myself some more poignant questions and go back and do the work and rework the story. And what's really fantastic about this session, it wasn't, it could be brutally honest, but I, I don't think we, nothing about this session felt like personal. It, it all felt like we were there to figure out this story's not working because of this, but there's something there that could tell better. If, if, the, if you can move this stuff around or there's something could be addressed better, I think that the story could work, you know. So that, I thought that was fascinating because it wasn't personal. It was more like a, a group collective consciousness trying to go in, how do we fix this story? And I really appreciate you guys' time. Well, personally, I, I'm offended by your shirt, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I am too, sir. I'm just missing my black hat, my numb robot hat. <laughs> Those of you in the audio world land, uh, Alex and I are both wearing the same shirt. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes. Black we're both polo. wearing that you probably oh, picked up at Target. Anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. You, you shop at Target? Fancy. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. With that said, hey, I, you got to give your plugs, Alex. Before we sign off, want you to tell us how things are going with this is Meg and anything else that people can find yeah. you or any free giveaways you want to tell people about. Yeah, um, I uh, for everybody who doesn't know, I've just finished directing my first feature film called This Is Meg, um, which is an ensemble uh, dramedy, and I'm in the middle of uh, probably locking a cut by the end of next week. We just finished wrapping 
<laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> so I've been I've been uh, been going crazy in the edit process. Uh, to find out more about this is Meg, just go to thisismeg.com, and um, and then we also created an entire uh, course on how I made this uh, called the micro budget. Uh, masterclass, and you can uh, you can take a look at that over at indiefilmsyndicate.com, and of course my website is indiefilmhustle.com, uh, and my podcast is uh, film it's at in, it's at filmmakingpodcast.com, but uh, you can always find it at Indie Film Hustle. Nice, nice, Dave. You, um, <clears throat> you still there? You didn't follow yeah, me? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> uh, just you know, you can find me at davebulls.com. Uh, I have my own podcast again, Dave Bullis Podcasts. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a movie I'm doing right now, nor do I have anything to give away. So other than that, uh, that's the end. That's it for me. Okay, and then Jason, where can everybody find you? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm in the bathtub. Hello, Hal. <laughs> Hello. Hi, guys. Um, well, Hi, Dave. If you check me out on Indie Film Hustle. <laughs> Indie Film Hustle. <laughs> they, wow. They <laughs> <What? the plug. laughs> so, uh, tell us. Uh, well, you're on it. Well, go ahead. Uh, I just finished a feature film called This Is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah I just finished, like, I just finished my feature film Unlike called This Is Ed. Wait, this is Fred? <laughs> this is Ed? This is Ed? <laughs> this is Ed. Um, it's very similar to This Is Meg, but nothing like it. And uh, <laughs> Got all my famous friends in Merida, Yucatan to come together. <laughs> Julio. Got it on the iPhone. It's great. <laughs> so people can find Jason Buff at IndieFilmAcademy.com, plus his great you know, uh, blogs and uh, podcasts. So, anything else? Knowledge. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a short film, horror Thank film. Thank you. There you go. Nipple. That, uh, Which is I'm, pornographic. Um, yes, it is pornographic. <laughs> <laughs> I am working. Three, it's three minutes, and it has taken me about two months now to get to a basic edit on it. So, post-production is a little slow, but we're, we're moving. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving on it. Hopefully, it'll be around for the uh, horror festivals, and uh, we're gonna put it in the Oscar, you know, contenders and all those. <laughs> nice, very yeah, nice. Uh, you know, I'm gonna be putting together like information about how we made that and little mistakes and things and all that, and that'll be online pretty soon. So nibble.com. I don't know if anybody owns that. It'll probably probably won't be nibble.com. Anybody... <laughs> it'll be owned in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is buying it right now. Damn it! <laughs> And bought. All right. Bought. Let me go for it. I also have Nibble Short and Nibble Short Film. Dot <laughs> com. I've got dot uh, dot USA. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I can't thank you so uh, enough. Really, this has been. Uh, I've. You Very guys good. know I've been trying to do this for a while. So, um, I hope people that sat through and watched this whole thing got a lot out of it. Um, I, I did, obviously, but um, and then I'm gonna do a follow-up uh, to show like what happens when you take the notes and you redo it, and then um, I've got to up the game. So the next time I present this, you know, um, maybe I'll add some visuals to it, so not just an audio presentation, and that way it could be like a true sort of brain trust where I have you know a wall of storyboards and and I have to figure out a way to act it out for you guys. So. <laughs> You should get into that acting thing, Scott. I'm just <laughs> a little bit. You have a very non-threatening look about you. So <laughs> very. I think you. I think you do well. Thank you, sir. Did I see you on Grim? No. Sorry. One question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Um, when you were, I, I, I uh, is this what they do at the actual Pixar? I mean, do they do they record it and stuff like that, or is this something that you have kind uh, of invented? That I invented. I as much reading and piecing people that have worked there and the, the time that I had taken a tour of Pixar to see how they put their story rooms together. It's based off like Disney a long time ago. They just have these huge rooms with these, these big boards and whoever's ahead of story would act it out or Walt Disney himself would act it out. Um, the difference was how was it, a lot of it comes from Ed Catmull's book Creativity Inc. You know how he's talking about the procedures of how the Brain Trust group operated. All these different talks are on YouTube. Uh, the having that candid discussion with Rob Edwards on the podcast, asking him what his experience was like. I was really trying to take go deep about what happens and how does Lasseter work and all that kind of stuff. And so from this, 
I was able to sort of narrow it down to like I think this is how we can approach. How we can approach. Whoa, did you just die? Did buff? <laughs> well, you're, you're scratching. I'm shot him. I'm All shot right. Him. Anyway, oh, so that's the the answer to that question. Is there's a lot of different formats or different coaches that have different ways of helping you get the story, you know, constructed. Um, I just wanted to show this to the audience to say that just because you finish the script, maybe don't make it yet. You know. You know, because that our indie film world, you know, we have to c compete with the majors, but in a different way. And I thought that if I could expose this process a little bit more and be completely transparent and show that maybe it, the worst case scenario I thought would be like, hey, podcast audience, I just finished my script and we're going to production. Not like you know, it's and people are like, oh, kind of like what I did. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's different. But you told us like how you're. <laughs> Like I did, like, hey guys, I'm making a movie next week. What? Yeah. <laughs> Total different thing. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. <laughs> I think, well, especially like if it was genre, like if it was genre related, you know, I think yeah. you had it all set up differently that way. Anyhow, um, that's that was the goal. And so I'm really curious to see the next iteration of this because I would love to be able to have it documented to be like, look at how crappy this thing was at this stage and then show what everybody can do on their own, which is if you're in the middle of about to go into production, um, have you vetted the script to the, the you know, the best way you can? Maybe, you know, it's it's hard, hard, sometimes hard with table reads because there's an energy in the room. You know, you can kind of hear it. Like sometimes it, it's like hearing your words spoken by actors is it's helpful. Uh, yeah. But sometimes sometimes there's an energy in the room where it even like the mediocre script can seem like a good idea because people are just in a good mood. Like they're, you know, and so I, I wanted to approach it differently, and I really... Well, I think this is really helpful. You know, one of the things that I, I've seen a little bit over the last year um, is people telling me that they're, like, you know, in the middle of pre-production or even sometimes they've even started production, and I'll be like, oh, do you mind if I read the screenplay? You know, just for, you know, just to see what's good, just to kind of get an overall feel for what they're doing and... Um, and these are mo mostly low budget, ultra low budget movies and whatever. And you'll read the screenplay, and it's like, it's it's like a second or a third draft, you know. And they've they've already moved all the trucks in, everything's in motion, everything's <laughs> going. And you know, if anything, just from shooting this short, and I mean, I've known this for a while though, is like you better love that screenplay. I mean, it better be your baby because you're going to spend a really long time working on that. I mean, unless you're Alex Ferrari, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if you, and when, when Buff Sorry. is done, I'm just going to quickly, before we go, just lay out what I did so people don't think I'm freaking nuts. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Good. No, okay, uh, I, of course, everybody knows Alex is uh, a friend. <laughs> just kidding. Not well. Just, <laughs> the, just a joke. <laughs> um, but, no, I mean, you know, I think it's so important to really love it and, and get a lot of, you know, do exactly what you're doing because even – even when you get it to the point where you love it, there's always going to be things that your brain is not very – like that you don't notice, you know. And it's always great to get it, other people in there who have kind of a different perspective to say, hey, you know, this isn't working for me. And it's stuff that a lot of times you're not even aware of, you know. It's like it pushes all your buttons, but it's like missing some other aspect that you're not aware of. And so – having as many people read it as possible. And I think that putting it in audio is amazing because for those – I mean I'm a horrible reader. <laughs> so, just like being able to put on the earphones and listen to it was was great, you know. And I think yeah. that's a cool concept. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. And again, I wanted to share that with any filmmaker out there. We have the tools; you can easily put it together to kind of see, like, is it working, not working? The same concept, like, how many times you watch a film on Netflix and you're kind of going, "Man, if they just what happened?" You know, like, if they just would have changed this and that. Because if I had made this movie, the same reaction would be like, "Well." There's stuff there, but man, it didn't seem like anything got going to the 43-minute mark. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that should be the name of the new movie, 43. 43 <laughs> anyway, so I want to wrap this up, and but I do want to give Alex enough time to rebut. So we're like not like going. So this is Meg at a different uh, approach to it, but go ahead and take, explain to us. So how just so everybody who's listening, if anyone is still listening after our <laughs> Miranda, um, that when I when I decided to go with this is Meg, I 
I was tired of the screenwriting process <laughs> as we know it. It is a very brutal process, and I think for me at least, uh, I've written many scripts in my day, and I've I've done a ton of movies in post production over the years, and I just felt that for me as a director, I was like, I want to go out and shoot something, and I don't want to uh, be bogged down for another year writing another screenplay. And then seeing if I could raise the money and so on and so forth. So I decided to uh, reach out to a friend of mine, uh, Joe Michelle Millian, who's a very accomplished writer and actress, uh, improv actress, as well as, as a stand-up comedian. And what I decided to do was um, go, hey, let's come up with a story and let's do it very improv style. But what I discovered through that process, it is, it's not as non-scripted as everyone thinks it is. Uh, Jilly and I put together a very structured story with scenes and beats and you know uh, following a structure all the way through and then with each, within each scene certain beats of the story had to be told uh, in order to move the story forward and and then how they got to those beats that's where the fun was. That's where we hired really amazing improv actors who can kind of get to those beats in a very fun way and a lot of times when we were on set uh, we kind of discovered stuff on set that wasn't there before. But as long as we hit the three or four things that we needed to hit in that scene, everything else was cool. And then there's other scenes in the movie that are completely scripted, 100% scripted, because the actors that we hired weren't as comfortable with the improv. They added a couple little things here and there, but they wanted structure because some actors really, most actors really like to have a screenplay to, to hold on to. So that was our process, and now gone through... 95% already of the editing process, um, at least to my eyes, it seemed to have worked. <laughs> Whether people are going to like the story or not, I don't know. I like it. I enjoy it. It's something I've never seen before. Um, but each scene moves the story forward. Every minute it's moving the story forward. Um, there's some fun parts in, in certain scenes, but this, the movie moves forward. There's no dead spots in the movie. So that is the process that I went down, and it, it kind of liberated me as a filmmaker, as a director, to just go out and do it, and we did it on a very, very uh, shoestring budget, um, and we knocked the whole thing out in eight days, and um, you know, I, I, I wrapped, what, the, the, the 7th of August, and we're, what's the day? 16th. The yeah, so I've, I've, I'm almost locked. On a cut. Yeah. Now, mind you, I've been cutting uh, a little bit along the way because we didn't shoot eight days in a row. But that was the process I went through. And it's just, again, if I was going to go do a, a big horror genre movie, this might not work. You know, the kind of story that you're trying to tell, Scott, I yeah. probably wouldn't go down this road with. It worked for this specific story. And I keep saying that to everybody. Like, for this story at this time, it makes sense. If someone came to me with a Marvel movie, $100 million, I wouldn't do that. Though they did do a lot of that in Iron Man. <laughs> did not have a full fleshed out script during Iron Man, and they were making up dialogue each day on the set, as per Jeff Bridges' uh, statements. And, and, and Robert Downey saying, yeah, we kind of made a lot of stuff up all along. That's why that movie has such a wonderful energy to it. So that was that's I just wanted to put that out there so people who are listening to this doesn't think like this crazy Alex just went out and grabbed the camera and just started shooting shit. Uh, <laughs> very structured, very planned out, and uh, hopefully people will like it when it comes out. Very cool. We're excited for you. Thanks. So man. that's it, guys. We you know we will take my time. Uh, follow up with you, gentlemen, later, and everybody else. I hope you really got a lot of value. And again, look for the, all the notes and all the links to everybody what these guys are doing. Alex Ferrari, Dave Bullis, and Jason Buff. Thank you guys so so much. That's it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Okay.